EKH, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night broadcast coming to you from the studios of VK3 CSJ in Nary Warren South. We are broadcasting on prime frequency of 3541 kHz in the 80 metre amateur radio band and simulcasting on 160 metres on 1865 kHz uh, in the uh, medium wave service. This is VK3 EKH ASV Radio, also broadcasting on Melbourne television repeater VK3 RTV. Good evening to folks watching the TV and uh, also streaming via the uh, YouTube channel VK3 CSJ. So you can find everything uh, on if you uh, type in VK3 CSJ on your YouTube uh, favourite search engine, which I think is common to YouTube anyway. Um, we also have a uh, chat window, a Discord ch chat window, uh, where you can come up and uh, share a few comments with other folks there on the chat window. It's a Discord chat window. The uh, link to that can be found on the ASV website at www.asv.org.au. That's www.asv.org.au. Look, go across to the Radio Astronomy tab and. Uh, Click on that and you'll see a little pull down box which uh, then will show the link to the ASV broadcast and uh, click on that and you can see the uh, not only the YouTube uh, stream uh, window uh, on that page but also the link to the Discord uh, chat window and as I speak we have a few folks already there. Uh, good morning Robert and uh, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, Robert, VK3XRA. Uh, Kim VK5 FUSE, uh, Sir Richard VK3 VRS, um, Bruce VK5 uh, VK3 MN. Where did I get the VK5 from? I don't know. Uh, VK3 MN, and uh, that's about all I can see immediately on the chat window. <laughs> um, there's uh, also a streaming service of being. Uh, uh, oh, that should be up. Uh, I just uh, EQ'd all that. Um, one, two, three, four. Uh, let me see if I can just up that. One, two, three, four. Okay, I've just lifted that level up a little bit, so uh, hopefully that's improved the level on YouTube. Um, oh, sorry, yeah, the TV side of it as well. One, two. <laughs> um, and uh, we also uh, have the email address, so if you wish to send signal reports uh, to, uh, to the station tonight, uh, we have the uh, inbox uh, being displayed on a separate screen and uh, call email address is vk3ekh at gmail.com vk3ekh at gmail.com and uh, you can send uh, email reports uh, there if you wish. Alright, this is vk3ekh broadcasting since 1988 um, on these airs and uh, and uh, of course, further information uh, about uh, ASV, uh, yes, about the station in general, uh, can be found on the qrz.com page. Um, just type in vk3ekh once you log in, and all will be revealed about the uh, the station here and uh, and uh, a little bit of past history as well. Not much, but a little bit. Okay, it's uh, 10.04 and let me just quickly run through what the uh, society is about for folks that are tuning in for the first time. And um, oh, first cup of coffee for the day. Oh, incidentally, um, for the ATV uh, folks uh, out there, uh, I checked the, um, uh, I checked the uh, uh, postage uh, track tracking number for the HD boards um, and they are finally aboard an aircraft and uh, heading to Germany as we speak. Uh, it was finally uh, shipped to an aircraft on, um, what is it, Friday, I think it was Wednesday, when I noticed the uh, notification that it uh, was inbound, or outbound, <laughs> and um, so the uh, high definition transmission boards for ATV are definitely on their way. I've notif notified uh, Mr. Stefan. Uh, in fact, I've given him the tracking number. So if he so wishes to uh, see where these boards are, uh, he can do that himself. Uh, but uh, he has uh, let me know that he is looking out for the parcel when it arrives. So uh, we'll be broadcasting HT 
again before you know it. Meanwhile, if you're missing the HD content on the TV repeater, again, go to our, my YouTube channel, uh, VK3CSJ, look for the live uh, a transmission as we speak, and uh, it's all HD from there, <laughs> reasonably HD anyway. Alright, VK3EKH, you're tuned to ASV Radio. The Astronomical Society of Victoria, founded in 1922, actually, out of interest, I, I was uh, checking the uh, Astronomical Society of South Australia um, today. In fact, I was checking up on, on a, an E. Callisto, uh, um, for an E. Callisto reason, which reminds me of something. Anyway, um, and uh, I note that the uh, Astronomical Society of South Australia was actually founded uh, in 18, now that I can't remember it, it was 18 something. <laughs> um, 18. I'm not going to say 1833. It doesn't sound right. But uh, anyway, it's it actually quite a, an older society. I didn't think there was one in Australia. So I thought the Astronomical Society won that down. But there it is. Uh, the Astronomical Society of South Australia, which we, uh, which the ASV do uh, um, share as a, as a sister society as such. Uh, we do... Uh, um, share a few things in common and apart from astronomy of course um, but uh, no that the South Australian Society has been around for a little bit longer I was really impressed to, to know that discover that today. so nevertheless the Astronomical Society of Victoria was founded in 1922 and of course this is the hundredth year celebration anniversary this year so lots of things are being sort of planned uh, it comprises uh, well over 1,600 members uh, scattered about uh, the states of Australia and uh, including overseas membership. Membership of the Society is open to all persons with an interest in astronomy. The Society's objectives are to encourage the study and practice of astronomy. We have monthly meetings which are usually held on the second Wednesday of each month. Uh, meetings kick off at 8pm at the Mullier Hall or the National Herbarium. Uh, which is located in Burwood Avenue, uh, not too far from uh, the Melbourne Observatory. Parking in that area is available along the Burwood Avenue, Dallas Brooks Drive and surrounding areas. Admission is free and visitors are indeed most welcome. In fact, we have uh, a monthly meeting. This is a new month. Welcome to, to March already. And uh, we have a, a monthly meeting uh, next week uh, coming up. So... Um, uh, I think it's next Wednesday. I'll, I'll be going on that in a second anyway. Uh, all right. So pr the privileges of membership <coughs> include the right to borrow books, periodicals, and other publications from the Society's extensive library located at Melbourne Observatory. Receipt of the ASV's magazine Crux, uh, containing articles, news, observing notes, and various other stories. Uh, there is also a free provision of the Astronomical Yearbook, um, which is where I'm reading from right now. This uh, is the beautiful publication that ASV does, and uh, it's, it's, it's uh, full of astronomical information for those looking through optical telescopes. Uh, <laughs> um, access is available to telescopes on members' nights held regularly at Melbourne Observatory, and after the um, and after the monthly meetings, where the meeting. These instruments include. Uh, the Society's 300mm equatorial reflector and a 300mm uh, re portable reflect refra reflector. reflector. We got it right. There's also a 200mm refractor which is managed by the Royal Botanic Gardens. Uh, there's also a photoheliograph too. The Society has a number of 200mm reflectors available for short period loan. Uh, for members that are wishing to uh, try before you buy kind of concept. Regular society club night meetings are held on the first and last Fridays of each month at the Lodge, the, uh, which is effectively known as the Lodge, yes, uh, located at the uh, location in Burwood. Members are encouraged to use the society's instruments located there to gain first-hand experience in how to use a telescope. These instruments include a 508mm equatorial reflector and a number of smaller reflectors. Members are also encouraged to make use of the Society's country property located near Heathcote, about 90 minute drive north of Melbourne. 
there are a range of instruments available for members to use. The larger two only with appropriate training which range from 300 millimeter to 1000 millimeter in aperture. Also located on site is the 8 meter radio 8.5 high stress uh, meter steerable radio telescope which uh, members can access once involved with the radio astronomy section. Members are encouraged to make and use telescopes. Advice and help on both matters are provided willingly to newcomers desiring to do the same thing. Instrument making is only one of the number of common interest activities catered for within the society. Other areas of interest that members can participate in include deep sky observing, astrophotography, lunar and planetary observing, auroral media, comet, radio astronomy, computing, cosmology and astrophysics, historical studies, research, astronomy in general. All in one word. <laughs> Uh, contact details for various section directors are provided in the yearbook here, but if you don't have access to the yearbook, because you, you won't get that unless you're a member of course, uh, you can go to the ASV website at www.asv.org.au and uh, look under the sections tab for all the links uh, that uh, connect to the various interest groups. Further inf information may be obtained by visiting the ASV website and uh, Notifications of events are given in the Crux Extra Bulletins. Now, the Crux Extra Bulletins are, come out every other week uh, as a supplement to the ASV's newsletter, uh, which is sent out to via email to uh, members. Please note that ASV will conform, conform to all government health directives. ASV events may be required to be cancelled, moved or postponed as a result of all that, but I think we're slowly getting out of all that. You can write to the Secretary, the Astronomical Society of Victoria, GPO Box 1059, Melbourne, Victoria 3001, if you wish. But the website is probably quite kosher, and uh, well, it is. <laughs> you can get all the information from from uh, the homepage of the ASV, the Astronomical Society of Victoria. Right, we're broadcasting on 80 meters, 3541, and uh, on 1865 kilohertz. So I'd uh, be interested in reports tonight because uh, we're, uh, we're running uh, linears uh, here in the back. You can probably see past my head if you're watching YouTube, uh, a couple of linears. So there's just a, a couple of extra 100 watts there running and uh, over the normal 100 watts. So uh, it'd be uh, interesting to see how the signals are around the, the place. In fact, have I, um, oh yeah, just making sure that things are working okay behind me. Oh, cheers. Uh, blah, 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 blah. All right, I can see there's a few emails there already, a few text messages. Uh, g'day, Chris. Um, <clears throat> let me see, I'll have to click on that to see what he's saying. Uh, where are we? Where's my mouse? There it is. All right, so Chris, VK3AWG. Okay, put, put, cat's fur. Uh, first time watcher here, he says he's put up a 16 element boom today and running a hello box. Uh, I'm located in Wallen and um, great report so far. P P5 picture Q5. That's what we want to hear. <laughs> oh, g'day Chris. Um, welcome to the TV and uh, I'm glad to see it's a, it's a good picture coming down that way. Uh, it's the standard definition broadcast here, I'm, I'm sorry to say, but uh, uh, we're going to hopefully get our HD boards back from uh, SR Systems very soon, maybe next year. <laughs> Might be that bad. Anyway, welcome Chris. Thanks very much for the report. Really uh, appreciate that. Uh, we have uh, Paul uh, Mitchell uh, watching. G'day Paul. Uh, VK3 Zulu Tango. And he gives me a 5 plus 10 to end block. And uh, we've got better than that. Uh, but uh, anyway, g'day Mitch, thanks very much for the report. Uh, we also have uh, Mr. Andrew, the K3KIS. He says, missed last week, but listening via the video stream tonight. So no worries there. I've got lots of images. If I remember, as I read out the articles tonight, uh, I've got lots of images uh, to run. So it would be a really good idea to uh, watch the YouTube stream or ATV uh, otherwise. Um, Okay, and uh, I think the other one is 
Uh, what's that, uh, Paul? Uh, Peter? Uh, Roger? R Richard, that's it. Discord stream as well, yeah, I think I mentioned that already. Um, <laughs> and uh, there's also, of course, Mr. Don, the K3HDX. Uh, great signals tonight, 20 on, on 160, yeah, it's, that's what we want to see. And uh, 30 on 80 metres, yeah, well, I don't think that's going to change too much. We've got a bit of a storm coming across, uh, just a little bit west of uh, Victoria, uh, west of Geelong at the moment. Uh, where they're having a, a Foo Fighters con contest going on. Was it a concert? concert that's it. Uh, Foo Fighters, never heard of them, but anyway, very popular it seems. Uh, Alright, now back to the inbox. So, yes, VK3 EKH at gmail.com. VK3 EKH at gmail.com. Uh, please send reports in on our 160 or whatever, yeah, wherever you're hearing me is, uh, is fine, or seeing me for that matter. Righto, uh, now it's uh, 16 past the hour and uh, I've got Sky Notes to go to uh, because it's the first of the month. Um, Tanya Hill, I think it's Tanya Hill, the resident uh, astronomer at the planetarium, uh, has uh, science uh, notes for uh, Sky Notes for, uh, for the month of March. And let me see. Uh, okay, she goes. She's talking. Starts off talking about um, an asteroid. Um, and yeah, it doesn't seem to be a very long discussion, so I might be able to just go straight into that without too many troubles. Uh, Arrow, Arrowkoth. It's called A W R O K O T H. Arrowkoth gives insights and gets names, apparently. Kuiper Belt object Aerokoth, which had a flyby visit by New Horizons probe in 2019, is giving fresh clues into how these far-flung objects may have formed. Aerokoth, designated as 2014MU69 and informally dubbed as Ultima Thole, Thole, T -H -U -L -E, Thole is a 35 kilometer sized icy double lobed world consisting of two discs joined at a narrow neck now i do have a i did capture an image of that so I'll let me just bring that up and get my audio back and uh so what you're seeing on the screen right now is the an actual image of this uh, uh asteroid um I think that's what it is. Kuiper belt. We'll call it a Kuiper belt object at this point. Uh, as it is, as what you see there is a 35 kilometer sized icy double lobed world consisting of two disks joined at a narrow neck. This contract contact binary objects. Sorry, this contact binary orbits the sun in a little under 300 years and lies over six billion kilometers kilometers from Earth in the frigid realm of objects well beyond Pluto. Not quite an asteroid. It likely formed as two objects slowly and gently joined under their mutual gravitational attraction. Some of the, something that has avoided me for a long time. It is considered one of the many small objects of planetesimals that formed from a collapsing cloud of material. Although Aerokoth appears to be 4 billion years old, under the right conditions it could have joined with others to form a protoplanet, and perhaps something larger. New Horizons mission data from a space probe that just keeps on giving is still being analysed, providing new evidence for these processes. The unusual object's remarkable red colour is believed to derive from carbon containing organic molecules mixed with methane ice. Names have now been given to some of the of its more obvious features. Arrokoth itself means sky. In the Pal Powhatan Algonquin Native American language. Yes. And other features now bear names from the Mayan and Bengali and Scanskit Nepal Mayalam and Sinhalese and Tamil traditions, among others. That's a tongue tie one, all that. The new world, completely unknown to humanity before 2014, 
uh, a mere speck of light before New Horizons visit in 2019 now has representation from many cultures so that kicks off the sky notes <laughs> all right let's just go back to me okay so as far as sky notes go and I'm going to try and get through these quickly enough as it is um, g'day Chris oh. Uh, Bruce is giving me uh, not a peep on 160. What do you mean not a peep on 160? Do you have an antenna connected to your radio? You're only just up the road. <laughs> anyway, that's okay. Uh, I know I'm being heard in Sydney. Um, <laughs> okay, Autumn Equinox. This month we have almost equal lengths of day and night. The equinox, the Earth's axis leans neither toward nor away from the sun. We are at the midway point between uh, summer and winter solstices. So, uh, yeah, okay, that's all she has to say on that. Uh, maybe a bit more later. Melbourne Sun Times, for those interested in sunrise and sunset, on the 1st of March, last Tuesday, the sun rose at 7.04, setting at 8 o'clock. At Friday on the uh, 11th of March, uh, the sun will rise at 7.14, setting at 7.45, with the day length being 12 hours and 31 minutes. On the 21st of March, Monday the 21st, the sun will rise at 7.23 and set at 7.30, 12 hours and 07 minutes. And by the end of the month, 31st of March, Thursday the 31st, the sun will rise at 7.32 and set at 7.15 with the day length being 11 hours and 42 minutes getting a little shorter moon phases there's a new moon on the 3rd of March been and gone uh, first quarter on the 10th full moon on the 18th and third quarter on the 25th of March moon distances the moon will be the furthest from earth perigee apogee sorry apogee uh, on the 11th of March at 404,268 kilometers and will be closest to the Earth perigee uh, is on Sunday the 24th at 369,760 kilometers you can almost throw a stone at it planets Mercury is still visible before dawn arising in the east from around 5:10 a.m. Uh, early in the month and then a little later each morning by late March it will lie too close to the Sun to be seen so once again if you have never seen the planet Mercury because you might think that it's too close to the Sun there are times a couple of times in the year where Mercury's orbit takes it away from the uh, glare of the Sun uh, early in the morning or late in the afternoon before um, uh, before sunrise and after sunset so you can see Mercury uh, above the horizon at around 5:10 a.m. Venus is very bright this month. It sure is, uh, living up to its reputation as the third brightest in the sky after the sun and moon. It is the morning star, rising from around 3:30 a.m. and will be clearly visible well into the early dawn light. Earth's southern hemisphere experiences the autumn equinox on Monday, the 21st, with the sun rising almost due east and setting virtually due west. Equinox comes from the ancient Latin uh, equinoctium, meaning equal night, and uh, medieval equinoxium to our modern term. On the 20th uh, of the month, the Earth's axis uh, at a fixed tilt of 23.5 degrees will not be leaning away from the sun as it does in winter, nor towards the sun as it does in summer. However, for Melbourne's latitude day and night are almost exactly equal in length a few days later on Wednesday the 24th. This four day delay is because the atmosphere bends or refracts light from the sun, allow allowing us to see the sun a little before it physical, physically rises and for a short time after it, it has actually set. I take these things into detail, into account. Over the next three months, the sun's daily path across the sky shifts northward a little each day until we arrive at the mid-year winter solstice. Uh, at, the, at that time, our planet's axis will lean 
uh, the southern hemisphere away from the Sun. Mars is close to Venus in the early morning rising shortly after 3 a.m. but being fainter the red planet will be lost in the dawn light well before Venus. Jupiter has moved beyond the Sun but will reappear again late in the month when it will rise in the east around 6.15 a.m. and will be visible for a short time before dawn. Saturn will also reappear this month before dawn early in the month it will rise in the east from 5 a.m. Uh, then a little earlier each morning by the end of March it will be visible from around 3.50 a.m. Uh, International Space Station The IWS orbits every 90 minutes at an average distance of 400 kilometers appearing like a bright star moving across the sky. Here are some bright passes expected this month over Melbourne. Okay well the 2nd and 3rd of March have gone uh, so the only other two dates they've got here is in the morning. So on the 23rd of March at 6, 23rd at the, on the 23rd of March in the morning at 6:25 a.m. to 6:31 a.m. coming in from the northwest to the east southeast, and then on the 25th of March, Friday the 25th, uh, coming in at 6:25 a.m. again to 6:31 a.m. coming in from the west to southeast. Of course, uh, the um, International Space Station, like many other orbiting objects, uh, can be all, all found at the Heavens Above website. Uh, the, Heavens, uh, the Heavens Above website it gives you uh, predictions for visible passes of the International Space Station and, and major satellites and a whole lot of other things. So if you haven't explored uh, heavensabove.com, uh, uh, do so. Um, meteors. Okay, there are two small showers this month. Uh, that occur near the South Celestial Pole SCP. If you extend the long arm of the Southern Cross 4.5 times that will bring you close, very close, to the South Celestial Pole. The Gamma Normids is due to peak around the 14th of the month centered on the yellow giant star Gamma Normae in the constellation of Norma the Level the other is the Delta Pavonids from the 21st, peaking in early April in Padvo, the Peacock. Meteor showers are best seen from midnight to dawn and from a location away from, away from the city lights. Stars and constellations. This always takes a bit of a while to read, 1028. Gee, half an hour already gone. Stars and constellations in the north northwest. The constellation of Orion the Hunter can be found in the northwest after sunset. From the southern hemisphere, he is upside down. Look for three bright stars in a line to form the Orion's belt, which also form the base of the saucepan teapot. We're not called the teapot, saucepan pot. Uh, from a southern perspective, in the sward. Or oh, oh, the scabbard that hangs from his belt, so it will do, uh, which is also the saucepan's handle, is is the Orion Nebula M42, uh, the 42nd item in the Charles Messier famous list of deep sky objects. Directly below is one of his shoulders, the red supergiant star Betelgeuse, or Betelgeuse, I think they also pronounce it as which has an obvious orange-red colour and diagonally across and above Orion's belt is the blue giant star Regal uh, that marks one of his feet. To the left and lower down is Taurus the Bull, its head an inverted V. This pattern forms the open grouping of stars known as Hyades. Uh, another easily recognisable red giant star Aldebaran some 65 light years from us lies at the top end of the open V. Below Taurus's head or hides is the Hades, is the Pallades cluster M45, the beautiful cluster of uh, at 444 light years from us contains over 1000 stars including a small number of uh, very bright stars. <laughs> you should test your eyesight and observing skills by counting the number. 
For some stargazing cultures, it represents a group of women and is often referred to as the Seven Sisters. In New Zealand, uh, the um, in New Zealand, the Otterra Roa, it is the Materiki. Its appearance marking the first part of the, the Maori New Year. Low in the north can also be seen Castor and Pollux. Sounds like a lot of Pollux. Pollux, the principal star of Gemini, the twins, Gemini. Gemini is how the Americans pronounce it. High in the north is the hot brightest star in the night sky, Sirius, uh, in Kansas Major, the great dog. Uh, and, uh, greatly, and directly below that is Procyon in Kansas Minor which is the lesser dog, both of which are Orion's hunting dogs. In the northeast, low in the northeast, can now you can now see the hook of stars like an inverted question mark that forms the head and the mane of Leo the Lion, the bright star Regulus. In the southeast, easier to spot is the Southern Cross or Crux lying on its side with Alpha and Beta Centauri, the two pointers below. If you can see the broad band of distant stars of the Milky Way that spreads across the sky from south to north, you will be able to spot the dark dust cloud known as the Coal Sack that sits beside the Southern Cross. In the east, in the southwest part of the sky, out on their own, uh, but best seen away from city lights, are the large and small uh, Magellanic clouds. Uh, our, our galaxy's nearest neighbours are at 163,000 and 206,000 light years away, respectively. Look for two fuzzy patches in the sky directly opposite the Southern Cross, which lies in the southeast. We are fortunate to see them all year round from equivalent latitudes in the Northern Hemisphere, such as Europe, North America, China, Japan, and Korea, they cannot, where they cannot be seen. There is a tenuous connection uh, between our galaxy and its neighbours and it would seem that they are being drawn in dest to, destined to join our galaxy in two and a half billion years. And I believe it was radio astronomy that discovered that tenuous connection between our galaxy and its neighbours too. So I'm going to throw in a few dates. I, um, I'm running out of time if I want to squeeze in these other articles. I might have to leave some till next week. I always do. Uh, okay, what is the date? It's the 4th of March. I might go up to, say, the 5th. <laughs> uh, on the 1st of March, 1966, Verona 3 crash lands on Venus uh, as uh, first probe to land on a planet. 1966. Good old Russia. Also on the 1st of uh, March, 18, sorry, 1982, Verona 13 sends the first colour images of the surface of Venus and continues transmitting data for two hours well beyond the 30 minute expectation. On the 2nd of March, 1972, Pioneer 10 probe launches to the outer solar system and still going. And on the 3rd of March 1969, Apollo 9 USA tests lunar module in Earth orbit for eventual moon landings. On the 4th of March 1979, Voyager 1 discovers the faint rings of Jupiter, with Voyager 2 taking further images four months later during its own flyby of giant planets of the giant planet. And on the 5th of March 1590, Tycho Brahe discovers a comet and shows that comets are further away than the moon, 1590. And uh, also on the 5th of March 1979, two probes and a satellite are affected by gamma ray bursts, leading to a study of these high energy phenomena. There's a whole heap of other dates there, but we'll go through that next week. So I have to keep this page open. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kila Hotel, the official station of the broadcast uh, of the uh, Astronomical, that is, the Society of Victoria. And uh, we welcome all new folks to the broadcast tonight that haven't tuned in before. 
Uh, you can see a TV image uh, of the transmission by tuning into VK3 RTV2, Digital Channel 2. Or if you don't have the setup for that, <laughs> you can find me in full HD. You can see that I haven't shaved uh, on YouTube. Uh, we just type in VK3CSJ, my call sign, on um, on the YouTube's fav favorite search engine, whatever. All right, uh, now, uh, g'day, Ian. Ian uh, Vic oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I knew I'd forget that. I'll just bring up that little thing. Thanks, uh, Richard. Struth. It's always something I forget. All righty then. Next is, uh, oh, I was going to say, g'day, Ian. Ian's giving me a report there on the email. Um, conditions are good tonight. Very little thunderstorm and static. The signals are stable and, uh, and good and consistent. 160 is strength 3. I think it's the first time you've uh, seen it or detected a signal on 160, I think, uh, Ian. All right. What was going to be next? Um, where's my thing? Oh, yes. Uh, okay. A quick rundown on James Webb Telescope. Uh, where are we? All right. Now, I was going to do a, a graphic here, too. <laughs> Strip. No. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, the James Webb Telescope is doing something called course phasing. It is step four of the process of getting this telescope looking at objects or doing science. I guess is a more correct way of saying that. Uh, okay, now let me see if I can just bring up this graphic first. It's just a little gift image which runs for a few seconds, 30 seconds I think. Uh, I've got it all sequenced here, so uh, no, it's not that one. Where are we? Um, web, that's it. It's just straight after the uh, that one. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let me just uh, see if I can fire this up. Uh, if I do this, I'll probably lose audio. Send by a second. I get this right. Okay. So on the screen, you're seeing. I'll, I'll repeat it. But, uh, let's see if I can loop it. Um, All right. I'll loop the this this image. You know, it goes for 37 seconds. But I'll read uh, what else uh, is involved with this course phasing. So what you're seeing on the TV is the phasing, is the course phasing te technique. And uh, it says here that uh, although image stacking puts all the light in one place on the detector, the segments are still acting as 18 small telescopes rather than one big one. The segments need to be lined up with each other with an accuracy smaller than the wavelength of the light. Conducted three times during the commissioning process, coarse phasing measures and corrects the vertical displacement or piston difference of the mirror segments. Using technology known as dispersed fringe sensing, we use NICCAM, N-I-R-C-A-M, NIRCAM, N-I-R, to capture light spectra from 20 separate pairings of mirror segments. The spectrum will resemble a barber pole pattern with a strobe, sorry, with a slope or angle determined by the piston difference of the two segments in the pairing. So that's essentially what you're seeing here is further alignment of the 18 mirrors uh, correcting for the um, the mirrors, the individual mirror segments. So this is all in the process of uh, aligning it to a single image. So it starts out as 18 separate images of the one star and, uh, and this process is designed to align kind of like stacking uh, in astronomical terms, in astrophotography terms, uh, but in this case it's also aligning the image so we get the one image. But there's further cleaning up of the images that is required and that will be step five coming up in the near future which we will uh, let you guys uh, know about. So it's, it's amazing technology that it's, uh, it's all going to plan and uh, there's been no glitches uh, to date so far or thus far and uh, it really is quite Quite amazing what's uh, going on there. All right, this is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, uh, ASV Radio, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. All right, now at 10:40, 20 minutes to 11, 
uh, I was going to demonstrate a solar flare. Bit tricky on uh, 80 and 40, uh, doing it on 80 and 160 because there's so much noise on the band. Because noise on top of noise is a little bit hard to discern. So, again, for those folks that are watching TV and the YouTube stream, will hear the solar flare much much clearer. Uh, so, what I'll do is I'll bring up the um, the graphic that they have here. Audio always disappears. Okay, so that's a uh, uh, a spectrograph of the solar flare. It's spread out between 17 megahertz and 29 megahertz. Actually, as you can see in the the graph there, it goes beyond uh, 30 megahertz. Um, this is so something that we we hope to set up at the uh, Astronomical Society uh, Radio Telescope Observatory at ASV. Uh, so spectrographs like this can be generated uh, of uh, of this part of the spectrum so you can actually see solar flares happening virtually in real time. Now the sound file, I'll play the sound file uh, which is this guy and uh, we'll just see how this goes if this is going to work for me. Uh, let me see if I've got the right file. Here we go. It's this one here. That's it. So I, I won't. I probably won't play it right this right through it. It goes for one minute and twenty-seven seconds. So that's a bit long for listening to a bunch of noise. But what you'll hear is that it'll start off nice and quiet, and then it'll just absolutely build up to a very very loud uh, noise, white noise. So those watching TV and um, and YouTube will get a bit of clearer sound of it. Uh, on 80 and 160, it'll just sound like a bunch of noise, but you should be able to discern an increase in the, in the noise floor. Uh, let's see how this is going to go. I hope it works. Is it working? Harlow. No, is it working? Is anybody can hear that? I can't tell. <sighs> One, two. No, I don't think that's working. No, that might. Be. Yeah. Um. Phones on so I can hear what's going on. One, two, one, two. Yeah, now why is that? One, two, three, four, five. <coughs> okay, we're just uh, working out this little technical issue with our sound file. Uh, normally I don't have problems here. Um, wouldn't it bother you? Okay, this should play. There should be plenty of audio. Oh, I know why. Because I didn't click audio. I'm still getting used to vMix. Hang on, let's just have another go at this. Um, where are we? Hang on a sec. Uh, where is it? Oh, I've got two.
Okay. All right. <coughs> now I'll, uh, <laughs> because I stuffed up the uh, the beginning of that a little bit, I'll just go back to the start of that and I'll play just the, the just the few first uh, seconds uh, where it starts off quiet and becomes quite loud again because I, I didn't quite get that synced with how I was presenting this. So uh, we'll just uh, do this again. So stand by. Okay. Ah, <laughs> uh, dear. All right. Um, that was uh, what. That's what a solar flare sounds like if you're listening to HF. Um, uh, anywhere in the uh, the upper uh, part of HF, let's say 20 megs uh, up, and you just happen to be, but me listening to uh, on 15 meters, um, and suddenly if you hear a um, an increase in the noise floor uh, that sounds a bit like that uh, that's a solar flare and um, this was just uh, yesterday in fact uh, the radio noise it's uh, this is uh, this is actually <coughs> if you go to spaceweather.com you'll be able to see that here and see this uh, report because I'm getting this from yesterday's uh, spaceweather.com uh, yesterday March the 2nd at around 17.39 UT, Sunspot AR2958 exploded, producing a M2 class solar flare. Moments after the explosion, a roar of static filled shortwave radio loudspeakers on the day side of the Earth. It was a Type 2 solar radio burst, says Thomas Ashcraft, who recorded the sound from his observatory in rural News, New Mexico. <laughs> uh, the radio burst kicks in at 15 second mark into the audio file. Uh, says Ashcraft, it's a stereo file uh, with 23 megahertz in one channel and 22 megahertz in the other. Try listening to by using headphones. Uh, you might be able to discern the frequency shift. Uh, type 2 solar radio bursts are caused by shock waves ripping through the sun's atmosphere. They drift through the short wave band always from high to low frequencies and almost always indicate that a CME, cranial mass ejection, is leaving the sun. Um, so there it is. Uh, that uh, image that you saw a moment ago um, is the um, is the, the spectrograph of what a solar flare looks like. And uh, of course the audio uh, a moment ago you heard as well. This is something that uh, we do a little bit of up at the uh, Radio Observatory uh, as part of the Radio Astronomy section of the ASV. Uh, now, as a, a bit of a side note too, I don't know if anybody caught up with uh, Catalyst this, uh, this week on Tuesday, um, but if you missed uh, Catalyst, I would uh, advise uh, checking the uh, iView. Um, I iView's... Uh, the website I view for catching up with the latest to Catalyst, which dealt with solar storm uh, activity and uh, the various techniques being used to record solar activity. And uh, very interesting, uh, they also spoke about the e Callisto project, which is uh, a network of uh, spectrometers that are being installed uh, by the average person who's interested in monitoring solar flare activity and uploading the data to a central server. Uh, where it can be analysed later, uh, which again the ASV is uh, a part of, and the Astronomical Society of South Australia is also uh, a part of that uh, e Callisto network. But they mentioned it in the Catalyst program, which was quite interesting to uh, to see. So uh, my advice is to uh, yeah catch up with Catalyst in, on iView. Very very worthwhile program this week. 
You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3EKH, broadcasting on 8160 TV and the World Wide Web. Uh, okay, at 10.2, oh my goodness me, I knew it this hour would go quickly. The next thing I was going to talk about, uh, okay, I'll, go, I'll jump to this one. Uh, okay. And uh, I've got a graphic for that too. Let me just bring that graphic up ready. Um, okay, it's just a just an artist's illustration, if anything. <laughs> nothing, nothing flash. Um, anyway, let's uh, bring that up. All right, article. Astronomers traced this FRB back to a strange place, FRB, fast radio burst. Researchers have tracked a mysterious radio signal to an old cluster of stars exactly where they wouldn't expect it to see, March 3rd, 2022. And the uh, illustration you're seeing on the screen right now, researchers have, um, uh, as I've just said, researchers have traced a fast radio burst to a surprising location in a nearby galaxy. It's a globular cluster full of old stars, uh, but uh, the Magnus, Magnus stars believed responsible for such bursts are young, rising quest, raising questions of how you could have gotten there at that point. So the, the article continues by saying, since 2007, astronomers have been working to unravel the mystery of brief intense flashes of radio bursts called fast radio bursts, or FRBs. In the ensuing decade and a half, they have surmised that these signals likely arise from a type of extremely magnetic neutron stars called magnetars. Now, work published on 23rd of Feb in the Journals of Nature and Nature Astronomy raises new interesting questions about these cosmic conundrums. An international team of researchers focused on studying a particular repeating FRB has announced two major findings. First, they have traced the fast radio burst back to an unexpected place in its home galaxy. And second, the intense flashes are so short, they must be coming from a region just a few yards across. Imagine that, a few yards. <laughs> Magne magnetic monsters, they're calling them. Astronomers currently believe FRBs are associated with magnetar, an extreme class of neutron stars. Magnetars, magnetic fields of 100 to 1000 times stronger than that of the typical neutron star and some 1000 trillion times stronger than Earth's magnetic field, neutron stars are already known for their small size, packing roughly the mass of the Sun into an object the size of Manhattan Island. This is one reason astronomers think that FRBs might be associated with them. In this particular case, astronomers measured the bursts from their target called FRB 22120E, that is 20200120E, lasting as little as 60 nanoseconds or 60 billionths of a second. That's even shorter than the usual f for an FRB. That tells us. I'll just come back to me. Um, that tells us that the flashes must be coming from a tiny volume in space, smaller than a soccer pitch, and perhaps only tens of metres across, said team co-walker Kenzie Nemo, Nemo uh, of Astron, which is the Netherlands Institute for Radio Astronomy and the University of Amsterdam. These ultra-short, ultra-powerful bursts, the team notes, are similar to outbursts seen from a more run-of-the-mill neutron star, albeit a famous one, the neutron star at the centre of the Crab Nebula, M1. These similarities, the team says, uh, collaborate the idea that the bursts they record, recorded are from a magnetar as expected. Further, they suggest that the, perhaps that there is an entire class of ultra-short FRBs like FRB 22120E, yet to be discovered. After all, they note, most FRB searches aren't designated or aren't designed to look for bursts on the scale of nano or microseconds. 
strange origins. But the conclusion makes the team other find even less expected, less expected, thanks to observations of uh, of multiple bursts from FRB 2220E using several radio telescopes. The team tracked the signals back to the point of origin on the sky. This has been accomplished for a few other FRBs, all located in regions of distant galaxies that house young massive stars. That makes sense if FRBs come from magnetars which are themselves the product of high mass stars that quickly burn through all their fuel before blasting themselves apart. FRB 2200-120E lies in the galaxy of M81. In fact, I've got a picture of M81 here too. There it is. Uh, M81. <coughs> oh, where was it? There was, yeah. So, uh, FRB 2200-120E lies in the galaxy of M81, a massive spiral just 12 million light years away. That makes it the closest source of FRBs detected to date. Detected to date. 40 times closer, in fact, uh, than the previous record holder. That's exciting on its own, but it's where M81 researchers found this particular fast radio burst that's raising eyebrows, uh, a dense old grouping of stars known as a globular cluster. This is not the place researchers expected to see magnetars, but uh, and not at all like environments of all known FRBs. Globular clusters are some of the oldest objects in the universe full of aging stars, <laughs> rather than young ones. We expect magnetars to be shiny and new and definitely not surrounded by old stars, explained team member Jason Hessels, also of Astron at the University of Amsterdam. According to the work, the location of FRB 2200-120E challenges the current models of FRB emission, which state that activity in young magnetars only recently formed by a supernova powers these strange blasts. If what we're looking at here really is a magnetar, then it can't have been formed from a young star exploding, Hessel said. There has to be another way. Finally, three paragraphs left. That other way could be a long predicted, but can be long predicted, but never before seen phenomenon in which a white dwarf, the remnant of a sun-like star, pulls mass from a companion and ultimately tips over a cosmic weight limit collapsing into a denser neutron star. This is called accretion-induced collapse. Although, uh, although posited to be rare in a dense region of stars like a globular cluster, it's the simplest and likeliest explanation, the team said. Another possibility, they add, is that the magnetar powering FRB 2200-120E is instead the result of a binary merger between two compact objects such as two white dwarfs or two neutron stars or perhaps one of each. Such systems are common in globular clusters and the result of a, of a merger could also create a highly magnetized neutron star capable of creating fast radio bursts. Finally, for now, the mystery... Uh, hang on a sec, just go back to me. <laughs> Uh, finally, for now, the mystery of FRB 2200-120E's or origin remains, and regardless of the answer, this discovery indicates there are likely many ways to create magnetars believed to power these strange objects. FRBs are continuing to teach astronomers that there is much to learn about how stars evolve and just how much they can puzzle us even after their deaths. <sighs> You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, where it is one minute to eleven. Uh, right. Oh, well, let's go straight to spaceweather.com. I had so much more there. Hands up for those who want to continue for another half hour. <laughs> no. All right. Uh, okay, so spaceweather.com. Let's go to spaceweather.com. And I've got a couple of graphics pictures here to show you too. The solar wind is currently at 406.3 kilometers per second at a density of 11.4 protons per cubic centimeter. There are currently one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven sunspots 
on the disk of the Sun as we speak. The sunspot number is 92. In fact, I can bring up that little image of the Sun uh, for those that are interested and can see in HD. So that's the that's the current disk of the Sun with those seven sunspots on them. And uh, I, I would advise that the YouTube stream handle that image much cleaner, clearer. Uh, but continuing on, the sunspot number so far, or thus far, is 92. And uh, <coughs> the radio sun is currently at 111 solar flux units, measured at a wavelength of 10.7 centimetres. Not SEMS, centimetres. The radio sun. Uh, and also, now, interesting uh, aurora here. I'll bring up this other image. Aurora, aurora, aurora there it is. Uh -huh. Cut and bring back my audio. I am there. Okay. <laughs> All right. So this is interesting color in this uh, in this image here. Um, okay. Firstly, before I talk about this, the solar wind stream approaches Earth. A stream of solar wind is approaching Earth. Estimated time of arrival: fifth of March. The gaseous material is flowing from the equatorial hole in the sun's atmosphere and it could spark minor geomagnetic storms when it arrives. The mystery of the orange auroras. You can see the aura there on the channel. A recent display of auroras over Canada has experts scratching their heads. What's the mystery? They are orange. Pilot Matt Melke uh, was flying at 36,000 feet over Canada on the 23rd of February when he saw the strangely coloured lights from the cockpit window. And you can see it here in the picture. He says, I've been chasing and photographing auroras for more than 30, 13 years, uh, often from airplanes. And this is the first time I've ever seen orange. So, what's so strange about orange, you might ask? Joe Minow of NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center explains, theoretically nitrogen and oxygen N2, uh, N2 plus and O2 plus can produce emissions at orange wavelengths, but these are typically weak compared to stronger emissions from the same molecules at the red end of the spectrum. It is hard to understand how orange could dominate in a rural display. So even so, milk, um, uh, um, yeah, the pilot says that they have appeared, these appeared to be uh, real aurora, auroras, and the orange fringe dance and sync with regular red and green auroras overhead it did not appear to be an artifact or city lights or distant twilight. Moreover, the pilot says, uh, saw the orange color with his naked eye, and his camera recorded it too. So there it is. I've never really seen any kind of orange in, a, in a, an aurora before, but there it is. So um, most uh, back to me, back to me. Okay, this is VK3 EKH, and uh, I think uh, that will do. Although if I go down a bit, um, 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 the the uh, potentially hazardous asteroids. Uh, as of the 4th of March this year, uh, there are 2,270 potentially hazardous asteroids. And the whole bunch of them there are on this uh, chart that you can see on spaceweather.com. And as we speak, the aurora over Antarctica is very weak at this stage. There is a little bit there, auroral oval, but it is so faint that uh, there would be nothing visible in the sky at this point in time. Okay, I think that's the space weather over and done with. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I had a few there to, to read out, a few others, but we'll leave those to, uh, to next week. So, um, now let's have a quick look at things up here. Um, just checking the, uh, the Discord uh, window, and uh, I can see there's been a bit of chatting going on, but it doesn't look like there's been any new comers there and no other new emails so uh, on that note we shall conclude the uh, the, the um, medium wave service and uh, for those folks that are listening to 160 meters uh, you're more than welcome to come up on 80 meters 3541 kilohertz if you have an antenna for 80 meters and um, 
uh, and come up on uh, the uh, quick callback that will run in just a, a few seconds. So this is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night broadcast, um, concluding transmissions on 160 for tonight on 1865. And uh, like I say, we'll, we'll do a callback on 80 metres. So thank you for those stations that have tuned in to 160. And uh, like I say, if uh, you are listening 160, uh, just send us off a report uh, to vk3ekh at gmail.com. vk3ekh at gmail.com just to give us a report on how far, a wire, fa far afield the signal on 160 is going. Um, we're using an IC756 Pro 3 into an FL2100 Zulu, about uh, around about the 400 watt level, into a vertical monopole down the backyard, 60 metres away. Uh, so it would be interesting to see how far we're going. This is VK3 EKH. Uh, for more information about the ASV website, uh, ASV, just go to www.asv.org.au. That's www.asv.org.au. Um, and uh, again, I forgot to mention uh, two things I've got to mention. So hang on there, guys. Just hang on a sec. We're going over time here. <coughs> uh, from the homepage of the ASV, uh, we have the Messier Star Party coming up. Tickets are available uh, from uh, the homepage. So explore the homepage of ASV. But the Messier Star Party is, uh, is uh, slated for um, the 26th of March from 2 p.m. onwards. So again, you, if you go to to, um, uh, to the homepage of the ASV, all information about the Messier Star Party uh, uh, is available. And uh, it appears that it is open to general public as well, from what I can see there. And uh, there's all sorts of things happening on that Saturday afternoon from 2, 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And uh, also, the other thing I was going to mention, uh, coming to calendar, this, just waiting for the calendar to load. Um, calendar, 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 there it is. Um, okay, this this Wednesday is the ASV's monthly meeting. Uh, you can attend the monthly meeting in Melbourne, as mentioned at the beginning of the transmission tonight. Uh, or uh, you can go to, it's a, there's a, there, there'll be a stream, as far as I know, uh, there will be a stream on YouTube, the, a the ASV's YouTube channel, and also on the Facebook uh, channel as well. Uh, and um, there is a presentation by ASV member Bob uh, Crossthwaite, I think that's how you pronounce his surname, Bob Crossthwaite, uh, on the history of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. Okay, uh, and of course why not, because we're celebrating our 100, year 100 years of uh, being around. So uh, ASV celebrates 100 years this year and as part of those celebrations we are bringing you a short history of the ASV from its humble beginnings in 1922 through to 2022. The Melbourne Observatory forms a large part of that history so, so as part of this month's Astro Talk uh, we will take you on a tour of the observatory and share more of its history with you. Um, so that's this coming Wednesday night. It kicks off at 8 p.m. Wednesday night, 9th of March, 8 p.m. And uh, just uh, you can view it on the YouTube channel, ASV's YouTube channel, uh, or uh, yep, go into Melbourne and sit in there and be part of the audience. That's what I wanted to also mention at the beginning of tonight's broadcast. But um, Sky Notes got in the way of all that. Okay, the, back to what I was doing. Concluding transmissions on 1865. Cheers, everybody there, and the standby stations on 80 meters. This is VK3 EKH. All right, now, um, pen and paper, and uh, let's see how we go. Turn up the volume. This is VK3 EKH, listening on 3541 kilohertz for any stations wishing to check in. Okay, I think there was a bit of a double. Uh, VK3 VIN, VK3 HDX, VK3 ACZ. Is there anybody else? Acknowledge, acknowledging VK3 JR, anybody else? Alright, so that's what happens when you go. 
It's ten minutes over time. Ah oh dear. Anyway, good evening Ian. VK three V I N VK three E K H. Good on you, VK3VIN. VK3EKH VK3 returning. Well, you know, over the 12 years that I've been doing this broadcast uh, since taking it over from uh, uh, from Russell, uh, I've uh, I have said uh, numerous times that um, uh, we should have a QSL uh, card for this station and um, something that really looks cool, uh, not not just an ordinary cartoon. But cartoon characters on it but um, something that looks um, out there <laughs> um, maybe I, uh, I could request for a, a special edition QSL card to represent the hundred years I think the ASV would be happy to uh, fund me that project <coughs> and uh, yeah maybe I can get uh, um, 100 cards printed 100 cards to uh, celebrate 100 years like a special limited edition that might work because I don't you know yeah that could work I'll think about that Ian that might be a interesting thought yes hmm all right <laughs> uh, thanks for the report thanks for the uh, the uh, note on the audio quality and uh, and the good signal on, uh, and I think it's, I think it's the first time you've begun to hear a signal on uh, on 160. So I'm glad uh, glad that's uh, come about. All right, thanks, Ian. Um, and your your uh, I think how many, how many watts? I think 10, 20 watts. I think you're running uh, is is coming through. You're about 10 over nine, somewhere between five and nine plus 10 thereabouts. Thanks, Ian. Across to you, there, Don. For K3 HDX, for K3 EKH. Thanks, Don. VK3 HDX, VK3 EKH, uh, and uh, glad to hear that. That's what we want: is folks to come back. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah. No, I think uh, operating the, uh, finally running a, a few more extra, uh, couple of extra hundred watts there is uh, is improved the signal uh, for HF. So um, 
Um, I thought that would be a good thing to do. Because uh, our bands are getting increasingly noisy. It depends on where you are, of course, but our HF bands are increasingly getting noisier due to uh, just the, the general background crap that seems to be uh, being generated by uh, crappy uh, um, electronic devices. So uh, you need to, need to run uh, um, a good lot of power to get over that in some places. Although Ian's doing pretty good for his low power tonight. Uh, okay, <laughs> thanks Don. Um, next station on the list is Peter, VK3 Alpha Charlie Zulu. G'day Peter, have a say. Thanks, Peter. VK3ACZ, VK3EKH. Very good. Well, I'm actually glad that the the uh, the, the noise uh, that makes up the bulk of that recording, the solar flare, uh, came across on uh, on 80, uh, and I guess on 160 as well for those listening. Um, because all I mean, all it really it's just, it's just noise. Uh, but there's a lot, <laughs> but there's a lot of energy. It's a solar flare, and uh, there's. Uh, there's a lot of energy being imparted into the uh, into the antenna system uh, for uh, for that to to, to 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 be able to hear that recording, and it's it's very broadband. It's not just uh, um, on a dedicated frequency. It's um, it's very broadband emission, and in most cases, solar flare, as it mentioned in the re in the report, <coughs> solar flare activity is. Um, uh, it usually starts high in frequency, let's, let's say around about 40 megahertz, and, and, and it shifts downwards in frequency at megahertz per second rate. So, um, uh, am I thinking of Jupiter now? Anyway, but uh, <laughs> most solar flare activity has that characteristic about it, and uh, by having a, a spectrogram uh, running, something that monitors a, a large range of frequencies, uh, at the same time, you can actually see the uh, the spectra, uh, the way it looks, and uh, and it is really quite interesting to uh, to see the structure of the solar flare and how it's dispersed uh, amongst the uh, the large range of frequencies, and uh, of course that and that's one way you can distinguish it from any terrestrial broadcast. Most, if not all, terrestrial broadcasts are uh, represent a solid line on those spectrographs, uh, but uh, Solar storms uh, are very much a part of nature and have a completely different characteristic when you look at it that way. But it is interesting, and I can still remember the first time I heard a solar flare, which was up at our observatory up, up at Heathcote um, at the Dark Sky site. And uh, we had the, uh, the speakers blaring out, and uh, all of a sudden we heard this massive increase in noise. And, the, and I, I went goosebumps. I just said goosebumps. I said, My God, that's a solar flare. We're actually hearing. Uh, solar flare at real time. <laughs> uh, dear. But it is amazing because uh, solar flare activity, as we all know, can affect the ionosphere pretty, pretty, pretty severely and it can kill the bottom out of it and, uh, uh, in other words, create uh, blackouts uh, at a good portion of the day side of the Earth 
and uh, some of our well-known shortwave bands such as 20 meters uh, can go quite inactive for uh, the best part of an hour or so before the uh, the ionosphere regains itself again uh, so it is fascinating stuff that is for sure all right thanks peter uh, across to you there frank vk3jr vk3 ekh vk3 ekh vk3 jr thank you very much uh, ask your comments last week. Could you tell me how the audio is? Yeah, that sounds good, Frank. Um, I'll accept that. Yes. Uh, fine. Yeah, very good broadcast. Thank you. Thank you. I've had a time for you. It's just, uh, it's just the place you're in the wrong 20 metres. Uh, and uh, I was uh, listening to a, a W at the same time over the long part. And he could, uh, he could hear it too. It just picked up the length nine. As you say, cover the whole band. Um, anyway, uh, Ian, you're sounding very good on your Zygon. I have a Zygon. I haven't uh, fired mine up in anger yet. Uh, I'd like to have a chat sometime with you about uh, accessibility, among other things. So maybe we'll organise that down the track. You're sounding good anyway. It's very nice audio here. Uh, otherwise, uh, nothing was to report the uh, uh, extra number is the same as it has been. Uh, 4651 with uh, 9 more awaiting the confirmation. Thanks for doing it, Clint. Uh, very high standard as usual. VK3EKH, VKJR. Thanks, Frank. We try. <laughs> VK3JR, VK3EKH returning. Thanks very much for the report, Frank. And, um, and uh, yeah, likewise, the uh, uh, audio sounding much easier tonight. I'm, I'm, I must admit, I'm uh, still listening to. Uh, to the audio from the, the unity with the internal speaker. Uh, I do want to connect the external speaker on the, on the 80 meter. I've got an external speaker on 160, but not uh, not connected to the 80 meter. So yeah, it's not uh, not a fair judgment uh, listening to the internal speaker. It's a crappy audio anyway, but <coughs> I can still make a fair assessment though, I think. Um, thanks, Frank. And uh, I'll just take one more quick listen on the band. This is VK3 EKH. Any other stations wishing to check in? Go ahead, Martin. Good on you, Martin. VK seven JH, VK three EKH returning. Very good. Good to see that we're getting across the straight and uh, with good signals too. Yes, I think, uh, like, a, like I've been saying, I think the um, having the, the, the linears uh, finally uh, connected back into the system has, uh, has improved the uh, overall transmissions here, so that's what we wanted to do. Okay, thanks Martin. On that uh, note, uh, everybody who's tuned in to the, uh, the Discord uh, chat window, uh, Rob, VK3XRA, good night to you. Uh, Kim, uh, VK5, uh, uh, FUSE, has uh, made a comment about uh, the has uh, he thinks that the QSL card might be a good idea, um, and uh, Martin has made comments there. Who else is there? Bruce, uh, VK3 MN, uh, super bright star in the east about 6:15 a.m. Yeah, that'll be Venus, and um, put the mouse up here. Who else is there that's come up tonight? Uh, I think that's really about it, actually. Yeah, um, my mouse is playing up. Each time I try to roll the mouse, it, the, the screen jumps around. It's time for a new mouse, I guess. Anyway, thanks everybody for coming up on the chat window. Uh, to the email, there's an email from Craig, uh, Mr. Cook, um, and he says down here at the bottom of the screen. Uh, he says uh, 80 meters was uh, S7 to 9, but it has been a long time since I've heard 160 signal, not even a beat now. I don't know why that is, Craig. Uh, I'm, I'm running the even running the linear. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm running the vertical. It's a it's a it's the monopole, the uh, Hushcraft MA160V that I've got down the back there. So. Don't get why uh, it's the signal's not getting down your way. It's uh, really unusual. Um, rain has just started. He says it's uh, 
it's uh, beating down on his tin roof um, and the barometer, the barometer has not dropped and the temperature is around 27 that's at uh, um, Cape what was it? Cape, Cape Cook, Cape Oh, I can't remember what it is now. <laughs> it's just left me. Oh dear. Um, Cape Clear, that's it. <laughs> thanks, Craig. Oh man. Alright, thanks, Craig. Good on you. Thanks for uh, coming in. That's, uh, that's excellent. Um, Alright, it seems to be some issue with the, the, your email. I don't know what's happening. The email is telling me delivery status notification failure. I don't know why that is, but you are there. You did come through. All right, on that note, we shall conclude uh, missions for tonight. Thank you very much for watching and, uh, and listening to the dialogue tonight. It's uh, 26 past the hour, uh, 12.26 UTC. So um, this is VK3 at Gokila Hotel. More information about the station can be found on qrz.com page. And, uh, of course, we do it on behalf of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. Uh, which uh, more information can be found from the www.asv.org page and uh, www.asv.org.au I should say and uh, we'll be back again at 10 o'clock to kick it all off next uh, Friday and do an organ with uh, some more interesting astronomical articles some of the ones that I didn't uh, get through tonight I'll, I'll keep over for, for next week uh, just to give you a bit of a an insight as to what I didn't get through so whet your appetite for coming back next week <laughs> um, uh, ice holds evidence of ancient massive solar storm uh, and then a analysis of radioactive chemicals in ice cores indicates that one of the most powerful solar storms ever to ever hit earth uh, was is dated around seven the year 7176 BC and they found that by drawing ice cores. Just stunning. So that story is next week. Uh, we're also going to talk about uh, Pioneer 10. It's been 50 years since NASA's targeted Jupiter and beyond. So there's a little bit of historic journey with, uh, with Pioneer 10. There's also a rogue rocket that will crash into the moon this week, shedding light on cosmic impacts. So uh, NASA, no doubt NASA TV, is the one to keep uh, uh, tuned to for that one but in the next day or so uh, they, they, they're saying here March 4 but this will be probably tomorrow US time uh, a lonely spent rocket booster will smack into the surface of the moon at nearly 6,000 miles per hour uh, the NASA's lunar reconnaissance orbiter will move into position to get an up-close view of the smoldering crater and hopefully shed some light on the mysterious physics of the planetary impacts so that's happening in the next 24 hours um, so there's a bit more detail in that article so I, yeah, I'll probably pick up on the uh, aftermath of that next week and uh, something about uh, could the International Space Station park in a spot one spot over Earth a, um, uh, I guess something akin to uh, where uh, We've got international satellites parked in a in a, uh, a polar orbit, or it's not a polar orbit, a Clark orbit, geo geostationary orbit. Is what I'm trying to say. So maybe that's what they're talking about. Maybe the International Space Station could be parked in a geostationary orbit. That could be interesting, but we'll see. That's an article for next week. <sighs> okay, on that basis, uh, we shall conclude. This is VK3 EKH shutting down the transmission, transmitter on 3541. TV and the video stream. Thanks for watching guys and uh, we'll see you all next week. This is VK3 EKH concluding on 3541. VK3 Alpha Charlie Lima, go ahead. Uh, Charlie Alpha Lima, Kelvin, Alpha Kundrup. Hello, Kelvin. G'day, Kelvin, have a say. Yeah, no, Yeah, okay, Kelvin. Um, well, 
a few seconds ago you were 20 over. <laughs> uh, a few seconds ago you were peaking, easily peaking 20 over 9, and then you slowly faded down to just above 9. So, all right, yep, there's the, the little bit of QSB there, uh, but you're certainly coming through loud and clear and uh, sounding pretty good from the internal speaker of the radio. So, uh, no worries, Colin. No worries, Colvin. Good to hear you. Cheers for now. VK3 EKH. Ah, uh, who was that? VK9 Alpha Radio Charlie, was it? Oh, that's cool. <laughs> Uh, VK9 uh, O zero was it zero or O letter O? Uh, uh, yeah, I think it's Oscar. No ninety. What is that? A, is it a, uh, a number O or letter O? Uh, zero, zero, zero. Gotcha, gotcha. No worries. QSL. VK9 zero Alpha Alpha Bravo Charlie. That's a difficult one. <laughs> um, actually, not a bad signal. Wonder where you're, whereabouts you are. VK9 uh, zero Alpha. Bravo Charlie, VK3, Echo Kilo Hotel. Right. <laughs> I thought you're far afield. <laughs> uh, VK90 ABC celebrating the 90th year of the ABC. VK3 EKH. Good on you, Chris. Um, excellent stuff. Yeah, you, 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 I tripped over that call sign a bit there. It's, it certainly, certainly sounds different. Um, being VK9, though, I was thinking you were uh, off on some uh, particular location, Norfolk Island or Lord Howe Island or uh, um, I think Macquarie Island's VK9 too, I think. I'm not sure about Macquarie, can't remember. But uh, you're a little bit closer to home, it seems. <laughs> That's all right. Um, anyway, thanks, Chris. Thanks for coming up, and I'll definitely do that. I'll, uh, I'll look up on the... Um, uh, the information page and uh, uh, the internet and have a bit more further look at that. Um, I, yeah, no, it's the first time I've heard that. I don't think even the WI News has mentioned it. Maybe they have. Maybe they did actually last week. Maybe uh, uh, they did. I can't recall right now. But uh, thanks, Chris. And uh, yeah, you're, you're about 10 over 9. A uh, bit of QSB, but you're hovering around uh, 10, uh, 10, up to 10 over 9. So uh, not doing too bad for... Uh, uh, the location in Gippsland there, didn't quite catch that actually, I all heard was Gippsland <laughs> thanks Chris, good on you, it's good, uh, good to hear the call sign on, on air, VK90 ABC, this is VK3 EK. the home call sign is VK3 CSJ by the way, uh, my home call is VK3 Charlie Sierra Juliet VK3 CSJ, name is Clint, Charlie Lima, India November Tango, and uh, EKH is the official call for the society VK9 Zero ABC VK three EKH. Yeah, Thank you. 
Thanks, Chris. VK90 ABC um, in Gippsland. <laughs> VK3 EKH returning. Yeah, cool stuff. No worries. Yeah, I've, looked, I've just located uh, the call sign on QRZ.com and uh, can see the information there. Uh, it's a special event call sign to celebrate the 90th anniversary of Australia's national broadcaster. Uh, and of course, more information can be found at the www.VK90ABC.net, as you're saying there. Uh, so I'll just click on that and have a quick look at that link as, I, as I'm on the page here on the air. Uh, there it is. Oh, cool. Amateur Radio celebrates the ABC's 90th anniversary. And uh, oh, yeah, okay. There's been quite a few stations already you've, you've worked on 20 meters, 40 meters. Don't forget to include me. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, very good. No, it's excellent. Uh, glad to, uh, to catch up. Thanks for calling in. Chris, it's fantastic. And uh, no, we're, we're not um, down at the Briars. That's the Mornington Peninsula uh, Amateur um, Mornington Pe Peninsula Astronomical Society. Uh, we are the ASV, the Astronomical Society of Victoria, which is uh, based in Melbourne. Uh, but uh, our dark sky site is up at Heathcote, uh, just near Ladies Pass, a place called Ladies Pass. Um, but the Briars is the uh, location for the Mornington Peninsula Astronomical Society, uh, which is not too far from here. Been there a few times, and uh, quite a quite a good society doing some great things there down on the peninsula. So um, excellent stuff. Good. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for calling in. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, this is VK3 EKH. If there's no one else, we shall conclude. Thank you, Um, I've really used Please just give me a report on my audio. Is it nice and clear? Um, and is it nice and sharp around the edges? Uh, oh, it's nice and sharp around the edges. No, it's doing okay. Um, I, as I've indicated already, I'm, I'm listening on an internal speaker in the uh, the Pro 3. So uh, the, the, the Pro 3 is set to uh, a 3 kilohertz bandwidth. Um, and um, <clears throat> what I can hear f uh, from... Uh, uh, by ear, it's 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 quite good, but you're not very strong. You're not super strong. You, you're five and nine, peaking ten. Uh, so you you're you're just not too far above my noise floor here. My noise floor hovers around S8, uh, so um, uh, you're not too far above the noise floor. But you you're clear. Your audio is clear. I'm hearing what you're saying. So uh, uh, that's the important thing. So no, it's it's, it's doing fine. It just could be a little stronger. The <laughs> um, VK90 ABC VK3 EKH. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I could see that on the uh, the QRZ.com page. There was uh, a reference to, to your call sign there. And um, I was going to say it, but I wasn't too sure it was you. But you are now. I can see it is. Cool. Actually, we're not, there it is. You're managed by QB. VK3 QB. Cool. You've had um, you've had 12,279 lookups on the QRZ.com page. That's not doing too bad. <laughs> Cheers, Chris. Oh, is that you, Tony? <laughs> okay. All right, you just come under the VK9 there, uh, VK3VAT. All right. Thanks for the report, signal report, and the audio quality, and uh, thanks for all the comments. <laughs> uh, dear. Thank you. Oh, I to turn off the wrong one. Um, thanks, Tony. Trust you well, and uh, I 
listening to a little bit of the conversation that I repeated before, so uh, uh, yeah, I think I know where you're uh, where you're at. Um, I, I think you were saying you're not, you weren't too keen about going to work tomorrow morning or trying not to go to work tomorrow morning or something along those lines. That's cool. That's the way it should be. I mean, we work, we work uh, our, our hearts out for five days a week to. Uh, to be given two days off and it's just the balance isn't right. <laughs> Somewhere I heard they're thinking about uh, making it uh, a three day weekend, so four days work. Uh, I think they're trying to get a consensus with their employees. Uh, we think that's a good idea or not. I don't know, three day weekend. Yeah, anyway, I won't have to worry about that soon if I decide to retire, will I? <laughs> anyway, thanks Tony. Uh, for K3, EKH is uh, clear on 3541. Um, something, something's not switching. Oh, my PTT's not doing its job. No, oh, well, never mind. Oh, there it is, now it's working. Alright. The stream, the stream is still running. Don't forget the stream, Clint. Um, yeah. All right, to everybody that's still watching the uh, the stream, thanks for watching. Um, don't worry about subscribing if you don't want to subscribe. That's fine by me. It's totally up to you. Um, I don't even know why I mentioned it. But uh, thanks for watching, and uh, we usually get about 20 people that. Uh, uh, check it the uh, the, uh, the YouTube uh, stream out and come back to it days later or something like that so good don't forget to watch the iview uh, iview iview yeah for uh, the catalyst program uh, that was a really good uh, good program last Tuesday so I recommend uh, catching up with the catalyst uh, yeah I can't play it now on ATV um, yeah, so uh, we shall close the stream. Thanks for watching, and uh, we'll be back again next Friday. Don't forget the ASV. Uh, no, this Sunday morning is the um, ah two things. This Sunday morning uh, is not only the WIA broadcast that I do, the broadcast of Bevan VK5 BD's visual representation of the WIA broadcast ten. 10.30 Sunday morning, but that will be followed by a 30-minute news bulletin uh, from the Old Timers uh, Club, uh, VK3 OTM, on behalf of VK3 OTM, uh, will be the um, uh, the Old Timers broadcast, which uh, will be presented only by Ian, VK3 JS. Uh, Bruce, VK3 UV, is not well, and uh, he's probably, from, from now on, will not be participating in... Uh, any further news bulletins, unfortunately, because he's uh, not well. Uh, so Ian vk 3 js is uh, is taking it all on his uh, shoulders to do the the 30 minute news bulletin, um, which is uh, which is really good. But it's an unsure question as to how how long he'll uh, continue to do it. Um, I think, from what I gather, uh, the uh, Old Timers Club is trying to find uh, somebody else that will take on the uh, Old Timers Net. So if anybody out there who's a member of the Old Timers Club uh, might think that doing a, a 30 minute uh, segment once a month uh, is possible, and I would wish for a video side of that as well for the ATV, that'd be really good, um, then uh, that'd be fantastic. So, but I'll be presenting the, uh, the news bulletin straight after the WA broadcast on Sunday and repeat it again at eight o'clock Sunday night. And then followed by Tuesday, the ATV QSO, I keep saying QSO party, ATV Net at 7, 8 o'clock on Tuesday night, hosted by uh, good old Neil, VK3 BCU, uh, watched by many. So, <laughs> so uh, that'll be Tuesday night, the ATV Net. Uh, and that's, that's about it for the forecasting at this stage. Have a good weekend, guys, and thanks for watching. This is ASV Radio, VK3EKH. Cheers for now.